This cop is about to abuse his power in the sickest way possible and all for his own personal gain. You're sexy. Is that unprofessional of me? I don't know, I'm sorry, but like, I'm just like, damn. You got like a, you got a room? Okay. D'Angelo Reyes. As Officer Reyes grabs the attention of a passerby during an investigation, it all starts off perfectly innocent, just like any cop making inquiries. She has no reason to be suspicious as this is a cop after all, but she has no idea what he has planned for. Officer Reyes is there on serious official business. He's supposed to be tracking down a murder suspect, but instead he decides to use this as an excuse to start a conversation with someone who catches his eye. I mean, I heard some noise that that direction, but I didn't Okay. Oh, do you live around here? Uh, yeah, I stay at the motel. But Reyes turns a routine inquiry into something a lot more personal. What's your name? My name? Mm -hmm. um, I'm Eric. Suddenly, he stops being a cop and starts flirting with the woman in question. He didn't even refer to himself as law enforcement, and he even gave her a false name, which is not only a bad conduct as a cop, but unusual for someone trying to make a romantic connection. But now he knows her name, and he knows what hotel she is staying at. He decides to be a lot more forward. You're sexy. Is that unprofessional of me? I don't know. I'm sorry, but like, I'm just like, damn. A cop in uniform calling someone sexy while supposedly asking about a murder suspect is about as unprofessional as you can get. This might look like a case of simple flirting, but Reyes is secretly noting everything she says, as he's going to need it later. He's planning on seeing this woman again and asks where she will be later that night. You just chilling tonight? Okay. You got like a, you got a room? Okay. Just me and my dog Felony. Oh, really? Okay. At that point, Reyes got out and took the woman's number and then used the police computer to look her up. The woman had a criminal history, something Reyes was going to use against her when he met her later at the hotel. The victim was meeting Reyes in good faith, but his intentions were much different. He gave her a choice, sleep with him or he would find a way to put her in jail. He did all this while he told his department he was running reports. The victim, who was no doubt terrified at going back to prison, allowed Reyes to but after the footage came to light, he resigned from the police force and faces a first degree charge for his crime. Charlene O'Banion. People in a position of power can often abuse that power to exploit others and fulfill their own needs. This can often happen in the prison system where guards have the ultimate control over inmates, like in the case of prison guard Charlene. So we're uh, detectives, we're not like internal affairs or anything like that. So. Mm -hmm. um, what is being investigated could be a criminal investigation and it could just be internal. But I tell you that to tell you that this is a voluntary interview. If you don't want to talk to us, uh, you're welcome to walk out at any time. Okay. Uh, having said that, um, let me see. we were notified um, of a possible improper relationship between you and uh, Jacob Parker. These detectives received a tip off that Charlene and Parker had been secretly seeing each other while he was serving at Conroe Montgomery County Jail. Parker was far from a model citizen and was locked up for crimes, including possession of a firearm and resisting arrest, qualities it seems are attractive to prison guard Charlene. I don't know anything about it. I mean... do, you, do you know who I'm talking about? Uh, he's, yeah, he's in pod six. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anything about it. I mean, he's just a trustee that we have, you know, around, and that's it. Okay. Have you talked to him on any jail phone calls or anything like that? Uh, no. Not at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that cell phone number you gave me, is that a cell phone or a house number? It's a cell phone. Okay. Do you have any other cell phone numbers by chance? Mm -mm. Okay. No. Um, where are you typically assigned in the jail? Uh, it depends. Sometimes I'm in pod five. Sometimes in, I'm in, like today I'm in e quad. Sometimes I'm in e quad. They kind of just all move this around. Okay. The detective is asking a series of questions that he already has the answers to. He is just giving Charlene her opportunity to tell her side of things, an opportunity she passes up, deciding to lie instead. If she just admitted what she'd done there and then, she could have saved herself not just one of the most uncomfortable interrogations of all time, but one of the most awkward interactions you'll ever see. And where is Jacob a trustee at? 
laundry. I've seen him in laundry. I don't think he's out on the floor or anything like that. Okay. And where would you think that, like, this allegation would come from if there's, like, if there's nothing to it? Um, well, I had a feeling this was coming. So there was an inmate um, named Coker, Justin Coker. Okay. And he got out of, he got out of here for, I don't know what period of time. And he tried to contact me on Facebook. And he sent me a message and I blocked him on Facebook. And um, I guess one time um, Parker was going back to Bequat to use the bathroom. And he was talking like at the window with me. Like at Equat, because I was in Equat, he was talking through the window. Mm -hmm. And I guess Coker like didn't like that, which I had no contact with him or anything. And um, I don't know why, like, he went up to, I don't know what was said between them, but he went up to um, Parker and said something, and then Parker ended up leaving back, went back to the laundry, and um, Parker had told me that he had gone up to him and was like, don't talk to her, or something crazy like that, and... I was just, I kind of just brushed it off. I was like, whatever, like, you know, because he had already returned. Like, he was out, and then he returned. And when he was out, that's whenever he tried to contact me. So, um, but, again, I never spoke to him or anything like that. Um, and, I mean, that was that. I just, I didn't think anything of it. I'm just like, don't listen to him, you know, and that was it. Okay. So. Right now, Charlene is trying to explain her way out of a tricky situation. In most cases, it would be her word against the detectives. All she had to do is keep calm and keep lying, and she could maybe get away with it. She may have concocted this story long before the interrogation, or she may be making it up as she goes along. But either way, these detectives are not buying it. So, uh, I'm just not trying to be rude here. I'm just, yeah. why would you expect this conversation to come up from that? Like now, if that happened a few months ago, I'm just... Trying to get where you're getting at there. Uh, you said you were kind of expecting oh, so something I, like this. I don't know why, like, this, I'm wondering if, like, Coker maybe said something, like, to get him in trouble or me in trouble. Like, I don't know if that's, that's the only thing I think that's, like, related that has anything to do with Parker. And then the detectives drop a bombshell and reveal that they know an awful lot more than they are letting on. They suspect that Charlene is guilty of breaking the Prison Rape Elimination Act of 2003, which was created to deter sexual abuse in prisons. It specifically forbids an inmate on inmate sexual assault or abuse and staff on inmate sexual misconduct. That conduct can include assault and more importantly, sexual relationships. Under the act, a prisoner cannot legally consent to intercourse similar to how a child can. So any sexual contact between a prisoner and staff is seen as abuse. So what Charlene says next may help determine her fate. So I was kind of told of this about, uh, what do you think, Chris, about 45 minutes ago? Um, so I don't know, I don't know exactly where, how it started, like who it started from. Um, but I was told um, that it was brought to somebody's attention and then we looked at jail calls. Um, and there's jail calls between you and Parker, yeah. and all that stuff's recorded. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't think you're being completely truthful. Well, I, I kind of know that you're not, and I'm not trying to be rude when I say that. Yeah, no. Um, I'm just kind of trying to lay it out on the table for you. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of get one shot at this of being truthful, and yeah. people, perception means a lot in uh, criminal cases and internal cases. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge deal. It sways people to do uh, a myriad of different things, you know, just, right. and this is kind of your chance to to paint your own image. Yeah. So, can you kind of tell me uh, what's going on there? Charlene maintains her innocence, denying any relationship at all, either inside or outside of the prison, and trying to suggest whoever gave them the tip off is lying. But the detectives know she is lying and let her spin her story. I guess a few years ago, uh, we, we talked and then I ended up here and then he ended up here. I didn't know he was here. I didn't like, it wasn't anything like that. Um, and that was that. Okay. Yeah. So when you say y'all talked, like kind of dated a little bit? 
before you started no, working there? No, no, like he, he was never like my boyfriend or anything. I just knew him from like the world. Okay. So are y'all kind of talking in a sexual nature no. now that he's here? Oh, no, no, no. Now that he's here, no. Okay. I mean, it's never been like like phone sex or anything like that. Like, that's not... But, like, we all joke around. Like, we all make, like, you know, like, that's what she said type yeah. things. But it's never, like... So what about some of these phone conversations? Um no, no, not here or the phone. I thought no, I just mean the conversations y'all are having on the phone. No, no. Since he's been in here. Like, like, sexual? It turns out that Charlene and Parker knew each other a whole lot more than she was admitting to. With over 400 recorded calls detailing the pair's sexual encounters inside the prison, as well as plans to be together when Parker is released, the detectives know it's only a matter of time before she confesses. But not before some extremely personal, uncomfortable questions. Well, not, I'm not saying having phone sex, talking about sexual acts. My, from what I'm listening to on the calls, I take it as that you've given him oral sex at some point, is what no, I, I gather from these calls. No, no, no. no, that was like in the world, but we never like, we never dated. We just. Okay. But you've, you've had physical relationship with him when y'all were both. Out. Out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That was before. Okay. But it was, we never like had sex or anything. It was just kind of like that. You gave him oral sex? Yeah. Okay. But that was before, like, I knew he would end up here or that I would end up here or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. And what a... And I know I'm sorry to get in your business, but no. the allegation's been made, so I want to have as much detail as I can right, right, right. to say either way. Mm -hmm. So when do you think that was about... I know it's going to be hard if it was a couple of years ago, oh, but... Um, let me think. I was... I want to say like in the past three years. She reminds the detectives again and again that all this happened before he was sent to her prison. She went on to say she had met Parker while out with friends in Houston. Parker and Charlene caught each other's eye and they have swapped phone numbers and met up a couple of times. And that, Charlene claims, is the end of it. But these detectives know better. Charlene goes on to tell the detectives that they have never been alone in the prison, but they have spoken on the phone. In just 15 minutes, she has gone from hardly knowing Parker at all to speaking to him regularly. For the detectives, it's still not adding up, so they decide to bring out their secret weapon. A recording of just the most recent call for us to listen to. Um, and kind of my intent behind that is, I still don't feel like you're, you're coming out with the whole thing. So, like I said, I'm not trying to badger you or nothing. Um, I just think that it's important that we know uh, exactly what happened. So. So initially you said you kind of like played it off like you hardly knew him. I mean, I didn't play it off like I hardly knew him. I just... Like, oh, you kind of like stood there and thought... Oh, right now, like, right oh, now. Oh, Parker, yeah. I think he's in pot six. Mm -hmm. But I just looked in the system there was like almost 400 calls. So between y'all. Yeah. You see, what I'm, you see where I'm coming from? Kind of how it would seem from my point mm -hmm. of view? Like I said, no, no judgment here. I just want to know the truth. That's, yeah. That's it. And I mean, yeah, you're right. I should just. So before we go into all this, do you want to just I mean, tell me the truth? Yes, I hesitated to admit that, but. The closer the detectives get to the truth, the more uncomfortable Charlene gets. She still denies doing anything wrong, even though she knows the detectives have every phone call she has made to Parker. If she had told the truth from the start, she could have avoided being confronted with their most damning evidence. What? I really wasn't, I, I, I really wasn't like tripping, tripping about not making a story this week because I've won the last three games in a row. <laughs> She's crazy, baby. What is it about you? 
Ya. Co to je? Can you just call me a stupid? Oh, that's, that's what you sounded like a while ago. No, I didn't say eh. Uh, yeah, you did. I mean, maybe just a little, but I wouldn't. Yeah. I didn't sound that. You, you exaggerated. That's so bad. Dude, I need to clean up my fridge. What are you doing, dude? I'm putting. Dude, I'm putting. I'm putting the leftover macaroni and cheese in the fridge. <laughs> oh my god. Even though, even though we all know what's gonna happen. Yeah, you're not gonna always... gonna eat them. <laughs> I am. In two weeks, you're gonna be like, oh, it's gonna look like a fucking science experiment in that refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like that right now. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Maybe. Yeah, it's bad. It's not that bad, but there's I there's yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm on your ass. I'm gonna clean, I need to clean that fridge out. <laughs> I got a lot of stuff to clean and get rid of before you come home. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Even though Charlene says it's been years since they were involved with each other, the way they're talking with each other tells the detectives differently. She is barely moved in her chair, but we can see that she looks incredibly uncomfortable with her legs crossed in front of her in a subconscious effort to shield herself from the cops. She's uncomfortable with being caught out in a lie, but things are still going to get way worse from here. Yeah, you're supposed to. I mean, you're stuck with me regardless, but. Oh, okay. I to, like, just... <laughs> I just want you to look at me sometimes and be like, damn, my woman's fine. Fine and wine. Hmm? Super fine. Super. Super, super. Oh, God. You are fine, baby. Hmm? You are fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Over the next few minutes, the most intimate details are revealed. And you got a, a live ass head game. Oh my god. <laughs> eh, it was in my best moments. I was just trying to get it done. Meh, meh. <laughs> are you in bed? Don't even get me thinking about that because it makes me so horny like just going back and thinking about yeah that I get you horny oh yeah yeah I mean you felt me I was like soaking through my clothes you're like a what is that word like when somebody just always like can get horny like at that I guess I guess that was... yeah I get very horny very easy like I'm I always want to have not sex. Good. Like, that's not even... Huh? Not good. I mean, it's not like I just, like, look at someone, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm horny. No, like, of course, like, I only get horny for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's just like, oh, my God, look, I just got someone. You can't see how that sounds from my, my point of view. Even after the call is played, Charlene still denies anything has happened in the prison and claims that all these references are from three years ago when they first met. Getting her to confess is proving tricky, so the second detective takes over and makes it very clear she doesn't have long to do the right thing anymore. Any questions coming to mind, Chris? Yes. So, I've noticed one thing, and I want you to understand this about both of us. Both of us are veteran homicide detectives, okay? I've been doing this a while. Okay. All right? You seem to have blanks in your memory when we get to certain details, but you remember being groped in a blowjob from three years ago. I find that hard to believe, okay? This is your one chance to be honest with us. Yes. Once we get up and walk out and we're done, mm -hmm. we're done. Maybe it was the detective's tone, or maybe she is feeling outnumbered and cornered. Whatever it is, it made her break. And suddenly, she decides the game is up. Yeah. And honesty is the only thing that's gonna help you with us. Mm -hmm. So my advice to you right now is to be honest with us. Have y'all had any inappropriate contact, whether it's groping, blowjobs, 
vaginal, anal sex, anything, hand jobs. Yes, I am being vulgar to get a point across. Yeah, no, it's not. None of that. Um, I mean, what is it? Uh, I might have given him a blow job in the back part of the... In the back part of the quad? Okay. Mm -hmm. How long ago was that? Uh, a few months ago. A few months ago. How long have you worked here? Uh, since April. Since April this year? Mm -hmm. Was he already here? He was already here. Okay. Do you know how long he's been here? I don't know. Don't know? Okay. Not at the top of my head. So you did, a few months ago you gave him a blow job in the back of B. Is mm -hmm. that correct? And that's B quad, correct? Yeah. Was any, were there any other witnesses to it? Okay. No. I'm just wondering because like you people standing around while well, I'm you were you were work days, right? Yes. Were you working days at the time? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm asking. Was anyone yes. around? Because no. I mean, everybody's up in daytime. Right. It's not like the jail's locked down. These detectives finally wore Shardlene down after almost an hour of questioning. She goes on to give details of the day she gave Parker oral sex in November 2021 and says that's the only sexual moment between the two since she started working at the jail. Even so, it's a disgusting abuse of power and horribly inappropriate act for the workplace and she's about to find out how much trouble she's really in. Oh man, I'm gonna so, ask, but I feel like I know the answer. I'm losing my job. So that's that's not really up to me. Um, Internal Affairs is aware of the allegations, um, and they will probably they their uh, in, investigation is separate from ours because mm -hmm. there's. Losing her job should be the least of her worries, as she was eventually sentenced to 100 days in prison, a surprisingly low sentence for such a brazen act of negligence and exploitation. Their relationship was consensual, at least, unlike this cop who was hiding some pretty dark secrets from his fellow officers and his girlfriend. I didn't pull my ass out and do anything out there. Did she? No. Do so you think they could be? No, it's not, no. Nothing of mine. The cop being grilled here is Officer Holtzclaw of Oklahoma City. He's being questioned over a traffic stop where a woman claims Holtzclaw made her perform a sexual act on him in the back of his patrol car. The 57-year-old female was allegedly pulled over for suspicious driving on June 18th, but it turns out that she was in the hands of a sexual predator with only one thing on his mind. Did your penis go in her mouth? No, it did not. Okay. Because DNA will clear it up, and here's the deal, too. I... It, we can fall on the sword okay. and say I screwed up or something, but if we say we didn't do it, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, and then the DNA comes back and says he did it, then we have a huge problem. What Holtzclaw did would make him the poster boy for racism, sexism, and abuse of power. She was not alone, and the police would find at least eight victims in total, but it all started with this one driver. After the traffic stop, the woman reported what happened to police, and it was immediately investigated. Holtzclaw admits to the traffic stop, but denies that anything out of the ordinary happened. However, what's unusual is that this stop was not officially recorded and happened off-duty. This makes the detectives think that Daniel is lying, so they dig deeper and go back through six months of arrests where they find a disturbing pattern. Now, I know you're an officer, and I know you've seen these a thousand times right. and you've read them yourself. Right. You still ask me any questions if you have one. Right. Okay, don't be embarrassed of that. Right. Okay? I think I'm already embarrassed. Why are you embarrassed? <laughs> why, tell me why you're embarrassed. The station deal, so. Nobody... Well, I mean, there's I mean, rumors flying, I know, <laughs> and we tried to do that as kind of quietly as we could, and that's why we took you out the front and stuff, but this is going to make the rumors go away, okay, okay? for you. Right. The rumor tomorrow is going to be on somebody else. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's get them off of you mm -hmm. and get them on to somebody else and get this over with. Okay. Okay. They discovered over 20 occasions where Holtzclaw has pulled over African-American women. Each of them had a record and most involved in prostitution. It appears on the surface that he wasn't upholding the law, he was actually stalking his prey. In order to find out the truth, they start with the traffic stop on June 18th, 2014. You had said, and we told you that there was a traffic stop, right. that somebody made some allegations against an officer. Right. They don't know the officer's name, none of that. 
but, and you said that you made a traffic stop after work, yeah. but you didn't call it in. I didn't call it in. Where was that? It was about Northeast 50th and Lincoln just to the west. Okay. Tell me about that stop. I was going westbound on Northeast 50th, probably a block just east of uh, Lincoln. I see a red Grand Prix, or Grand Dam, in my right lane, and the outside lane, I'm in the inside lane. The car swerves, and so at the time I'm thinking, okay, it's a, probably a drunk person, or maybe he got excited because they saw a cop. So I kind of fall behind it, kind of drifting just a little bit, not crossing lane lines, nothing crazy. So I light it up because it, at first the traffic violation I saw at first when it swerved, and then made contact, it was a black female, um, asked for license insurance, um, stated that she didn't have insurance, gave me an ID. At the time, I'm like, do you have a valid insurance or a valid license? She said no. I told her, I just got off work. I mean, <laughs> what's the deal? You know, why, why are you swerving? And she says, um, I'm just trying to go home to Ann Arbor-ish on the northwest side to see your daughter or something like that. The detective already pointed out that he didn't call the incident in or write up a report, which cops are supposed to do even when they're off duty. This is usually only when a situation calls for it or to assist on-duty officers that might need help. At this point, it's Holtzclaw's view that he was the right to make the stop. He asked permission to search the vehicle, but found nothing suspicious. The driver told Holtzclaw she was off to see her daughter, and so he let her go on her way. Or at least that's what Holtzclaw said happened. Um, do you remember her name? It was on the I don't, description. I don't. Okay. okay. Um, do you make traffic stops normally after work? I don't, but in that case, I saw her swerve and whatnot, so I. I mean, me, yeah, I don't. Felt. After I, get off work, <laughs> I know. I mean, people I know, cop, cops say that is have a you know whatnot <laughs> right. to have the vision, whatever. But I felt like I needed to make that traffic stop. Okay. How was she? Was she respectful? Was she She not? felt like she, she was nervous and whatnot. And I'm like, why are you nervous? And she was even crying. I'm like, why are you crying? Why are you nervous? What not? And she's just like, I don't know. I'm just nervous because you're a cop and I got pulled over. I'm like nothing you had to be nervous about. And I told her, I'm like, I don't really want to take you to jail for no SDL or anything. I just got off work. I'm tired. So with my officer, um, courtesy or whatnot and said so go get that taken care of tomorrow. Notice how Holtzcall throws the phrase whatnot into the conversation over and over. By doing this, he is allowing himself time to fill out the finer details later and to appear like his answers are off the top of his head rather than rehearsed. The detectives concentrate on the time he had the suspect inside his patrol car. Okay, so you got her out of the car? Yes. Okay. Um, and put her in the back of your car? Yes. Okay. Um, any problems there? No, she was cooperative. Didn't give me any problems or whatnot. Okay. And then you searched, did you run her through Unit 800? I didn't. You didn't? Mm -hmm. So, did you run her on your MDT? No, I didn't. All my all my stuff as far as that, because I didn't even call it in and say I was a traffic stop, my computer was off and everything as well. Did you shut it off after I just shut it off, work? yeah. On the way, on 50th, I turned it off right before the traffic stop, basically. When you, um, when you put her in your car, did you pat search her? Uh, when I came here, I was like, lift up your shirt. Is there anything on you, anything as far as your waistband or anything like that? She said no. And then I put her in the vehicle and went from there. Did, did your hands go on her at all? I backhanded, I backhanded her on as far as the side. Where on her body? Tell me. You backhanded her. Her waist, her waist, and the back portion. I didn't touch her or anything, but the back portion and the waist. And then she lifted it up like right here. And there's nothing Did she on lift it up like this? No. Okay. So she never, like, Went, ooh, nothing no. exposed her or anything like that. She asked me if I was like, no, it's okay. She asked you if it, you want to search me. I'm like, no, it's okay. Uh, so she never like put her hands on the car and you. Ch -ch 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 -ch. No, no. Okay. Being a cop, Holtzclaw knows exactly what he is in for in the interrogation room. And more importantly, he knows what to say or not to say to avoid getting in trouble. Everything he did during the traffic stop, he made sure he got consent from the driver, or at least that's what he tells the detectives. In his eyes, he's the perfect cop, but that image is about to be shattered. Well, she's, it, it sounds like this is the lady, I mean, this is the deal where she's the complaining party. Okay. Okay and she's making some sexual allegations, obviously, because Strums is working it. Right, what did she say? Well, was there anything 
an accidental touch of anything. If she thought it I, when I passed her through, but I, there was nothing as far as I felt like I would do anything as far as sexual or anything like that. And for my safety, I just checked to see the weapons or anything. And, and I, to make clear, I didn't that. didn't touch her butt by the waist side and whatnot. If you would like me to do it, for me to show you. <laughs> no, and I'm, fi I'm fine with it, and you have every right to do that. Right. She's saying that you made her lift up her shirt, and sh and when she lifted up her shirt, she exposed her breasts. No, no. Did you ever see I her asked her, is there, I asked her, is there anything inside your bra? And she said, no. So I was like, okay. And she said, you want me to show you? And that's all the time I said, no. No, you don't need to do that. She said that she said, "Do you?" Want, she said she was doing this when you said, "Is there anything inside your bra?" And she was, "Well, no, I don't have anything like." That. Did she do that? Yeah, she did, but I didn't look or anything like, like that. Right. And then she was like, "Do you want me to show you?" I was like, "No." She said when she said, "Do you want me to show you?" You said, "Yeah," and she went, "No, I didn't." But could she have been, woo, -hoo, flashing you? And what? now you don't want to tell me because you're afraid you're no, in trouble? No, when I told her no, I said no. Then she didn't go, yeah, no. you know, because sometimes drunk girls are... Having a good time. Yeah, uh, and, and no. partying down, and let's face and it. I've already heard stories about officers people, and whatnot. They and so want officers want, for hubbies want, so or whatever. I said no. And, or, I said no. But you could have said no. But I'm asking you if she flashed you anyways. I didn't see her. I didn't see, see her. I didn't see her. Best. The detectives move on to another line of questioning and one that might seem odd to someone watching, but he's actually trying to corner Daniel by eliminating every possibility until he has nowhere left to hide. What about pants? Nothing in her pants as far as that concerned. She was wearing tight jeans. So she said she pulled them down. I didn't see it. You didn't see her pull them down? I didn't see her pulling down pants. Could she have done it when you were up searching the car? She could have. I didn't Did have she her, have them on? I didn't have her handcuffed or anything. When you came back to the car and got her out, were her pants fastened? Were they? Yeah, everything. They was were still, up and everything was still intact. So you never everything. saw her pull her pants down. No, I didn't. Holtz Claw let the driver go without giving them a ticket. The driver had no reason to take out some kind of petty revenge by making allegations against him. Holtz Claw has covered his back well and is refusing to give the interrogators anything to go off of. He's confident, calm, and showing no signs of stress. So it's time for the detectives to ramp up the pressure and get more direct. We knew you were on that stop. Yeah. We knew you were there. Mm -hmm. And we can watch a whole lot of actions being performed while you were there, mm -hmm. okay? That's why she was trying to give you every out on the whole booby thing. Right. Okay. Now, is there any reason, any reason at all, even from whatever angle, because, you know, it takes a little bit to clear up those videos. Right. But any reason why your penis would be out? No. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. Now, and doing this, you know how saying exams work, and I ain't got to explain about DNA or anything like that. Right. Now, I didn't say you had sex with her. Right. Okay. But getting a blood job, okay, that is a different story. Right. Okay. You see my concern here. I'm just listening to you, sir. I, I know, I'm... but I'd rather listen to you and you start talking. That's all I have, sir. Are we are we gonna get something from the same exam? Go with the same exam. Do and do you understand that you don't have to full blown ejaculate to get something out of the same exam? Right. We can get skin cells. We can get pre ejaculate. We can do all that and still get DNA. Right. Old school seems pretty prepared for anything, and he has stuck to his side of the story so far. But when the detectives bring up the name of another victim, they could have the chance to catch him off guard. You probably don't, not necessarily going to remember the name, but her name is Terry Morris. Okay, black female. Um, supposedly, you promised her a ride to the city rescue mission. This ring a bell? No. You did a, a traffic stop with her. Uh, she thought you ran for warrants, was a clicking, you drove her around. Mm -hmm. no. name, name doesn't, I don't recall a name like that. Okay. 
She's claiming the same thing. The exact same thing. Another woman, also African-American, has made an almost identical allegation, but still, it's called keeps us cool and gives nothing for detectives to go off of. Okay. Anything. I don't, I don't do you remember, do you remember stopping? I don't recall a name okay. of Terry Moore. Well, I wouldn't remember a right. name. How about black female downtown, city rescue mission? That's what I was trying to jog your memory. I haven't been to a city rescue mission. I didn't say you made it there. <laughs> Have you I've promised been, anybody a ride to the city rescue mission? I haven't mission? asked any, anyone asked me to the city re, uh, rescue mission. No, a, she didn't have to ask you. Did you offer to take anybody to the city rescue mission? No, I don't offer anyone because I don't like going there. After some personal questions about his sex life, the detectives decide to return to the 57-year-old victim who made the allegation. They hope to trip Holt's claw up by asking the same repetitive questions over and over until he either gives something away or confesses. Did your pants come unzipped? unbuttoned anything while you were standing right there? No. CSI is processing your car right now. Right. And when we stepped out, they found some bit hairs right in here. <laughs> Could they be yours? No, that's not, I didn't pull my out and didn't do anything right there. Did she? No. But do you think they could be? No, it's not. No. Nothing of mine. Your pubes couldn't be no. right there? No. Has your penis ever been out Do by your I'm car? While I'm working? No. Not working? No. Have you ever had sex in the back seat of your car? I have not. Because, I mean, some people do. You know, I mean, I'm not saying for sex, consensual sex. Right. So your penis has never been in your back seat? Mm -hmm. Is what? it possible any of this DNA shares? No. Not, that's I would like to go go at it. Not my DNA. Are those pubes gonna be yours? No, no. Are you worried about it? I'm this whole situation I'm worried about. In order to get what they want, they start to get even more personal, and Holtzclaw obliged, telling them how proudly he has sex every day, and had even tried to have sex with his girlfriend this morning, which might be a way of explaining any trace of sexual activity on him. The problem is, his girlfriend says different. You created some more work. Yeah. Fixing to go. <laughs> I just talked to Karen. Okay. She said she was asleep when you got home, and you did not try to have sex, and you did not have sex. Did she says you didn't. And I asked her, could you have been asleep? And you have kind of, well, no. And she said, no, she, you did not try to have sex. As much as I don't want to involve her, I tried to have sex with her and she was asleep. Carrie goes to sleep pretty early, about nine, 10 at the late. At okay, the but she would know if you try. I'm a woman. I know. And, and my husband comes <laughs> home in the middle of the night and I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been asleep. You said you twirled around her vagina I did. and you put it in a little bit and then she said, I'm tired. No. I did. She would remember that to tell me. She, maybe she you. said you did not try to have sex. <laughs> and it's more personal because it's Carrie, but I did try to have sex with Carrie. I did. What to say? I mean, because it just looks like I just caught you in a lie, and now I don't know I, what to believe. I'm telling. I don't know what to believe okay. because you tell me this, I go to verify it. She tells me the opposite, and now I'm now I'm wondering what you're telling the truth about. Maybe because she's she doesn't know what the heck's going on. No, she doesn't. I didn't tell her. And I'm glad, but the tag is calling her. Any other officer asking her a question like that? I know. She's maybe scared. And I don't want to involve her, but she's involved that's because my you, girlfriend, that's a, you need her involved for you. Right. But now she's given the story that you're not given. I'm, I'm telling you, I try to ask 
This was Carrie, my girlfriend. Old Squaw's story is slowly unraveling, and although he didn't confess in the interrogation, the cops had seen everything they wanted to. He was eventually tried and found guilty of the sexual assault of eight African American women who were all classed as vulnerable, so he probably saw them as an easy target. Officer Holtzclaw would be sent to prison for a 263 year sentence, which outraged some of the online community. Many saw the interrogation as one sided. As far as they were concerned, the investigating officers thought he was guilty and based their questioning on that. They found DNA on the fly of his work pants and assumed it to be from sexual activity, but that was later proven to be false. The DNA came from several people, one of them a male, so it's likely he just picked up the DNA while on duty. But the courts made their decision based on the evidence they were given, and any takes from members of the public online were seen as just rumors and nothing more.